Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 13 to 17. Listen to God's word. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized just as he was coming up from the water, suddenly the heavens opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, as your word took on flesh and dwelt among us, as your word incarnate entered the baptismal water of sinners, you remind us again and again of the many ways in which you draw near to us, in which you are faithful and with us still. And so we pray by your mercy that you will Open our senses to you that we might see and hear and taste and smell and listen and feel you with us always. And by your grace, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a way of hearing scripture with which many of you may be familiar. It's called Lectio Divina, and it is a way of reading scripture or hearing God's word that is part listening and part prayer. Now, rather than just simply reading through the text just once, it's actually read four times through, out loud, slowly, so that the word can wash over you, sink in, and that the hearer might notice that which might bubble up in God's grace. It is not a way of approaching scripture that relies heavily on commentary, on translating the text from its original language, but it is a way of opening not only one's ears, but one's mind and one's heart to God's word for us. Now, I remember a day in seminary and a class on spiritual formation when a professor invited us to notice ourselves in the text. She read a passage from the Gospel of Mark, and I was aware that I had not envisioned myself jumping into the text, but rather had approached scripture from seeing Jesus coming to me, meeting me where I was in the ins and outs and ups and downs of my daily life. But that way, I, that day I sat and I listened and I found myself by a roadside in the seat of a blind beggar with Jesus leaning in and whispering, what is it that you want for me to do for you? Now the short passage or pericope, if you want the fancy word for it, that we just heard is a story that has fewer words in it than most children's board books. It's only five verses long It's a familiar text, and 
if I had my druthers, I would probably preach about 18 different sermons on just these five verses because they're really, really juicy. So keep reading it, sit with this text, and listen some more on your own. Now in these five verses, we go from dry, dusty ground into the waters of the Jordan. God speaks from earth and from heaven and hovers somewhere in between in the form of a dove. Now, depending on the day, I have found myself in different locations in this text. I've heard God call me beloved, assured that I belong to God's too, to God too. Now, at other times, I have found myself among the bickering cousins each filled with a little bit of certainty that they knew what was right and that they were going to do what they did best decently and in order. I have been confused and I have tried my hardest. I have been right and I have been wrong. I have been in need of mercy and I have been required to forgive. And I too have been baptized and baptizer. When I hear the words of this text for today, I am always reminded, though, that no matter where I find myself encountering God's word, I am always encountering God from the vantage point of my own flesh. I see myself in this text as one with a body, with mud between my toes and water dripping off of my face that needs to be wiped away. I see myself as one who's trying to relate to God and teach about God and serve God using my hands and my eyes and my ears and my voice, using my body as an instrument, as a tool. But I recognize that I am a human being who can only relate to God and this world as such. Now, I say only because, let's face it, there are limits to human existence. There are blind spots in my vision because of where my eyes are situated on my head. And there are blind spots in my heart because of the implicit biases I carry, because of the vestiges of my own social location at work on my life, and honestly, because I am stubborn. I can only run as fast as my short legs will let me run and that my asthmatic lungs will let me breathe. And at this stage of my life, I am strikingly aware of all that my body cannot do without ease anymore, like reading fine print. I have bifocal contacts in my eyes and reading glasses as a headband for good measure. I cannot jump to my feet, even though I am a mom to a five-year-old who crawls along on the floor playing cars day after day. I can't just get up on my feet without a little groan anymore. And yet I am present to all of which I am capable and perhaps even skilled at this stage in my life. One commentator writes this, we are not wispy souls trapped temporarily in a body that is foreign foreign to who we really are. Our bodies are integral to who we are as human beings. Our hope is not to become a disembodied soul, for that would mean hoping to become something less than we are something less than what God created us to be. Instead, we hope for the renewal of all of creation, including the renewal of our bodies. Our hope is to become fully and completely human. Fully and completely human. Friends, that I am. There's gray hair that stubbornly resisted this magnificent red my hairdresser put on my hair last week. There are limits to my 
my sight and my understanding. And there is a world to be experienced magnificently through senses. We know what it feels like to be fully and completely human, even as our own experiences are so different from one another. But the remarkable aspect of our text for today is that Jesus also is fully and completely human. The second person of the Godhead dives right on into the messiness of humanity, not only born as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, but once more reminding us of the fullness of his humanity by insisting that he too would enter the waters of the Jordan with the rest of humanity in all of our messiness. In the waters of the Jordan, Jesus again demonstrates just how far God is willing to go for us. Jesus' baptism is not to free him at all from sin, for as one commentator writes, though it is as a righteous act of solidarity to whom and for whom God has come. The one who is now being baptized by human hands amid a call to repentance is also the one who will usher in God's kingdom and bring the good news of forgiveness to those with the same human hands. In Jesus, God is submerged in the fullness of humanity, not just in the vulnerable, vulnerable beauty of a newborn baby, but Jesus wades into the waters of sinners unafraid, insisting that it must be so. And as Jesus stands up out of these waters, still dripping wet, the Holy Spirit de descends upon him as a dove, and the voice of the divine parent can be heard resounding from the heavens, claiming Jesus, affirming his actions and pronouncing him beloved. See, the Trinity is, in fact, in this together. Through the veil between, breaking through the veil between heaven and earth so that God's love can fully be made known. Now, when my son was two, he and a friend were splashing in the water of a water table in our front yard on an early June Saturday. Now, it was minutes, or maybe less than minutes, that these two toddlers turned away from the water in the water table and toward the empty planters at the bottom of the steps to my porch, where there was dirt and more dirt just in two-year-old reach. Okay, so there was no stopping them, and I loved it. They were covered in dirt from head to toe and making dirt into mud and washing it off again, standing in buckets so their feet were wet and their hair had dirt dripping down in streams across their faces. The other mom looked at me and shrugged, and I shrugged back, and we said, let's just let them go for it. Because we are not really allowed to play in dirt for too long, unless we start to give it one of those productive names, like gardening or sculpting. So we just let the kids be kids. They got covered in dirt. They ruined the lawn, which is still not in such good shape. And then we hosed them off in their diapers outside, which they also loved, before traipsing them through the house for a proper bath and a good dinner. As I think of this story, I am reminded that parenthood is a constant reminder that being a person is messy business. From dirty diapers, to mud pies, to scraped knees and runny noses. Yet the reality is that at any age or stage of life, when one human being cares for another, no matter who it is, when you need to use your hands 
to ensure that another person is safe, is well, is loved. It is impossible to ignore that bodies are messy and do messy things. Not just the bodies of little people who count their own hiccups in the car while their mom pumps gas, but 36, if you want to know, but all of them. Being human is messy. And let's face it, human beings make messy choices. We fight, we fall short, we take the easy way out, we're cruel even when we don't want to be, we are ignorant. We can act from selfish motives and we can act simply because we don't have the information or resources or wherewithal to do any better than we were able to just do. The outcome of every choice is not as easy to clean up as a muddy two-year-old who has spent the afternoon digging in planters. But Jesus, Jesus makes it clear that he is not afraid of the mess. In love, he dives right on in, showing solidarity with even sinners. And then he has dinner with them, and he calls them to be his followers and his friends. Jesus is not afraid of messy bodies and messy choices. He just meets up with them, with us, where we are, and in that space teaches or heals or forgives or tends or feeds or loves. Jesus ministers to the mess in everyone he encounters, unafraid, full of love. Tax collector, leper, hemorrhaging woman, child, demoniac, outcast, Pharisee, sinner. But he doesn't heal them of their humanity, and he doesn't heal us of our humanity either. For we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But rather, Jesus heals all people of whatever is holding them back from knowing the truth of God's love, from sharing the reality of God's love, from experiencing fully God's love. Baptism is a mark of unity, a un the unity of God to humanity and the unity of us to one another. In Jesus' baptisms, he stepped into the water of sinners as an act of solidarity with all of us. And then in our baptism, we are reminded that through Christ, we are heirs to salvation. Jesus meets us in our messiness, then washes us up, shares his own clothes with us, and gives us new life once more. And then... It goes further than this. For it is in baptism that we are united to one another. When an infant or a child or an adult is baptized, we name the one who is baptized. And we proclaim in our liturgy not only that they belong to God, but that they belong to us. They are members, too, of a messy but lovely family, siblings in faith. And as Christ's body in the world, we then let the baptized one know that they too are beloved. And we promise to accompany them on their journey of life and their journey of faith. We name that we are in this together, life and church and hope and doubt and that we will be present to one another in the messes and the holiness, not because we have it all figured out, because we certainly do not, I'm raising my hand because I do not, but because God is with us and God will show us how. So as we remember Jesus stepping into the waters of the Jordan, May we boldly 
step into those waters too. May we name our own messes and claim our redemption. May we confess our sins and hear God's own voice name us beloved. Then clothed with the love of God in Christ, may we head out into a world of complex messes and scraped knees and runny noses and lots of dirt and through our deeds and our words, let another know that they are redeemed, that they are forgiven, that they belong, that they are loved. With God's help, friends, may it be so. Amen.